Friends, Dave Politis, k and Missing Project, copyrighted edition for a video channel, and Huck is in the building. How you doing, Huck? Yeah, you're a good girl. She's been out playing. This isn't her favorite time of the year. As it gets warmer, she doesn't like it, because she's got a full coat. She's got two coats, actually. Now, an inner coat and an outer coat, and... She doesn't like the heat. She would rather it be minus 30 and out there playing in the snow than sunny and 65 degrees. She doesn't like that. But she'll still go out and play. He's a good girl. Thanks for coming in and saying hi to the folks, huh? Yeah, we appreciate that, Huck. Giving us your time like that. So, before I get too into it, I need to do some thank yous here. The Eclipse. <laughs> Somebody sent me from Texas. The Bigfoot Eclipse. Thank you. People, very thoughtful gift. And uh, Huck's already back. She goes, hey, what's that shirt, Dad? I haven't seen that. Yeah, I know. So, uh, again, missing person segment. And this is a this one's a little different. This is a national park missing person search. Mount Rainier National Park. Now I've told you before, Mount Rainier has a lot of disappearances. In fact, in the last 10 years, they've had a lot, a lot. In the last 30 years, they've had a lot, a lot, a lot. So I'm not sure what's happening there. But I've been there many times, almost every year for the last five. I like that park a lot. I like it because you can get outside of the main people area and it gets very rural, very quick, and very wild. And <laughs> I like it because there's a lot of strangeness that has gone with that park over the years. And I mean, it's, the area around the base of the, the National Park has tons of Bigfoot sightings. I was at a uh, conference in Washington two or three years ago, and a family came up. A family, I'd say, kids were in their teens, and mom and dad, the kids were very open about it and said that, Around their house, they'd have Bigfoot knock on the windows, knock on the doors. They had tracks around their home. They didn't seem to really give a rip. But, and then, just recently, within the last week, I had an individual send me some pictures over email of some tracks he had on his property in the Midwest. And he said, should I be scared? So, remember, I, I studied Bigfoot way before I started studying missing people. And part of what I studied about Bigfoot is historical crimes against people by alleged Bigfoot. And there was hardly any. I don't care what anybody says. There's hardly any. There's uh, some very, very old ones, hundreds of years old, that talk about it not killing, just taking them and returning them. Um, there's some historical background, maybe 150 years ago in Northern California, where a hairy man took some Native Americans, but it's very, very rare. In modern times, have I ever heard of a case where Bigfoot killed somebody? No. Uh, in modern times, if I ever heard of a Bigfoot kidnapping somebody from a credible source, no. So, there's a lot of channels out there, and I'm not talking about Steve, so don't think I am. There's a lot of channels out there that employ three, four people that go with the channel. And they bring in people who tell stories. Most of the time, they won't give a name, a city, an age, anywhere, any way to vet the story. So two of my friends worked for two different companies like this that have really big 
channels, podcasts, and they both quit after several months because these channels were fabricating stories. And they said, Dave, we couldn't do it. Uh, it hurt our integrity and we couldn't be involved in it. We left. The reason I'm telling you this is that I think too many of you get wrapped up in these stories and you start to think they're true. But, I mean, from somebody who's looked at the historical context of it, I can't find any that are credible. And you may say, well, these people seem real honest. Well, so do actors on TV. <laughs> if you're getting paid enough money, you'll make it look real. So be very cautious on what you listen to and who you believe. So let's get going with the story. This man's name, and this is not in the Missing 411 Washington book. It was my mistake that I did not include it. This man's name is Chet Hansen. He went missing November 11th, 1997. He was 27 years old. And he disappeared from the east side of Mount Rainier. He was employed by Alaska Airlines. And he lived with his parents Rick and Karen Hansen in Wilkeson, Washington. Family described him as an extremely experienced hiker in very good shape. And he was a professional level amateur photographer. Remember I told you about this photographer association within the last month? Remember the young man in Indiana? I told you that for some reason, people who dabble in photography tend to disappear. Way more percentage-wise than regular old hikers in the woods. Now you're going to say, well, Dave, why is that? I wish I knew. I wish I knew. I don't have a good explanation for it. My gut tells me that these people are out in the woods. Maybe they accidentally photographed something they shouldn't have. Now, I've worked at, looked at thousands of photographs over my lifetime where people say, I took the photo and I didn't even know this was in it. Yeah. It's happened to me too. And maybe that happened to Chet. Maybe he was in the park photographing something and it didn't want to be photographed. I don't know what to say about it. But he was professional level photographer. And he knew Mount Rainier National Park very, very well. He went there regularly to take photographs. Now there was some conjecture that he took a big tripod with him and a lot of big equipment, 30 pounds worth this might not be true, um, and I'll get to that in a minute. But on November 11th, in the morning hours, Chet left his home, told his mom that he was going to be back for dinner, specifically said that. She said he was carrying some of his camera stuff. He never said where he was going, but he said he was going to go film in the woods and shoot maybe in the park. So she didn't know for sure. But she knew some of the areas he liked to go. At 11 o'clock on November 11th, he hadn't showed up. And his parents really never got that worked up about it because there were times he would go out and do that and stay with friends. So time out for a second. All of you young people out there, young people I'm saying under 30, who are living with their parents, if you tell your parents you're going to be home at a certain time, respect them enough to call them if you're not going to be. Because you know what? We love you probably more than anybody else in your world. And parents worry all the time. And just blowing them off and spending the night at somebody's house and not calling is not right. And you could say I'm an old fuddy-duddy. I don't care. You just don't do that to people that love you. Now, that wasn't the case with Chet. He wasn't staying with anybody else that night, as would turn out. 
So the next day, his parents knew that he was going to work at Alaska Airlines at 2.30 in the afternoon. Well, he didn't show up in the morning. They just figured he was going to go to work. Well, at 3 o'clock that afternoon, Alaska Airlines calls their house. And Rick and Karen Hansen are there. They answer the phone and they say, hey, is Chet okay? He didn't show up for work. Alarm bells start going off the parents' head. They knew something was wrong. Well, they got off the phone and they said, no, I think he's missing. I think he might be up in the woods missing, but we'll get back to you. Well, the mom immediately called the Wilkeson Police Department where they lived and reported her son and that car he was driving missing. Well, the Wilkeson Police put out a nationwide alert on the car and on Chet saying that they were missing and if they see the car hold it if they see him check his and make sure he's okay standard protocol it's entered into what's called NCIC and any time a policeman anywhere stops that license plate and the dispatch runs that plate it'll come back with that information on the license plate. Well, Wilkinson police contacted the National Park Service and said, hey, could you check your park for this car? Because we think this person may be there and may be missing. Well, it's about 11 o'clock that night that National Park Service gets the call and they dispatch a couple units out to go look. And guess what? They found the car. Yeah. At 11 o'clock, they sent a, the NPS had on their east side a, a National Park policeman, and they found the car parked at the Deer Creek Trailhead on the east side. Rangers go up, check the car, it's locked. They look inside, nothing really unusual inside. They call for a couple other National Park police, and they're gonna go out on the trail, they're gonna call Chet's name, they're going to turn on their siren and their lights and they're going to try to make a scene. So if you're lost out there, you can kind of follow the sounds in. It's called a hasty search. And they, a couple of rangers did go out there. They didn't find anything. Nothing responded. A whole lot of nothing was going on. But they had found the car. They notified Wilkinson PD, who immediately called Chet's parents and said, hey, we found the car. It's on the east side of Mount Rainier National Park, which wasn't unusual for Chet to go there. So let me explain this. This is Mount Rainier National Park. This whole area right here. The Deep Creek Trailhead for the horse camp is right here. There's another trailhead right here near Shriner Peak. Cars parked right off of Highway 123 in a turnout for the trailhead. I'm going to talk to you more about this in a minute. This area is lusciously beautiful, folks. Thick. Uh, I've had several other cases in this area. Sad to say. Well, Karen and Rick Hansen get that call in the middle of the morning. They load up their car, and at 3 a.m., they arrive at that trailhead. And they know that their son isn't somebody that gets lost, especially on Rainier. He knows his way around the woods. This wasn't something they ever thought would happen. So something serious happened in their mind. Well, as they entered, NPS talks to them. They got a couple of uh, officers there. They've already made a search and rescue call up for that day. And they sit down with the Hansons and they fill out what's called a missing person questionnaire. And what is that? Well, that helps the searchers, the search commander, make a profile of the person they're searching for. It has questions on there about age, weight, physical activity level, scars they may have, tattoos, dentist's name, their athletic ability, their knowledge of the area, do they take any medications? All these things go on to this. 
And let's just say, for the sake of talking, this isn't the case for Chet, but let's just say uh, the person had a couple blown knees, used a crutch, um, was somewhat debilitated, maximum walking distance is two miles at the most. Well, then search and rescue would put their parameter up at two miles, search everything inside that area. Chet's a little different. <laughs> Very good shape, knew the park, had all day, and was supposed to be gone all day. So, if he got to the park, let's just say at 9 a.m., then how far could he hike in four hours? Because if he, and the reason I say that, he was going to be home for dinner, which would have been six, which four hours out, an hour or two, taking photos, four hours back in drive time, thereabouts. That's how you kind of formulate it. And if you're the ranger sitting up the search and rescue, you look at a map and you say, okay, person in really good shape in four hours, maybe they could hike four miles, five miles. You write it down. And you get out a map and you draw a radius circle from that trailhead out four miles, and that would be your search zone. Well, at that early morning hour, search teams had already started to arrive. And in fact, they wanted to go out right away. National Park supervisor on the scene said, wait until late. Well, the first two teams went out on what's called Kotsuk Creek and Chinook Creek drainage. Those were the first two areas that were checked. They had more teams coming in. They had about 75 searchers by the end of the day, a couple of canine teams, a good response. They found nothing. November 14th, the first full day of searching, they had six dog teams show up, 30 ground pounders. I mean, somebody asked me the other day, hey, Dave, what's a ground pounder? That's somebody who puts their boots on and pounds the ground all day with his feet looking. Somebody, a hiker that's looking for somebody, a search and rescue hiker. It's a ground pounder. They had two helicopters. And late in the afternoon, why don't you pay attention to this? I have the search and rescue reports on this and the National Park Service reports. And I read this about three or four times because I couldn't quite believe it. And trust me, 99% of the time I say good things about National Park Service searches, but I'm gonna call them out when it's BS. This is BS. They said that in the afternoon, one of the canines picked up a scent and tracked it for several miles till it got dark. And when it got dark, they stopped and went back. Uh, what? <laughs> what? I read that and I could, I said, what? Wait a minute, there's somebody's life at stake out there. That dog's on the scent. You keep him on the scent. Why do I say that? Because Dave has done searches at two, three, four, five o'clock in the morning with dogs. It doesn't matter what time it is. You're out there, you're a life-saving organization. You better go out there. And don't tell me, well, Dave, you've never hiked in mountains. No, that's that's not a lot. That's a lie. We, we had searched mountainsides before several times for people that were missing. So don't, don't give me that crap. It doesn't matter. You're trying to save a life. Now, there's a good chance there's something more to it that the NPS did not explain. Maybe. But I'm sorry, you don't quit because it's dark. Now, also on uh, November 14th, the NPS interviewed all the family members they could find and friends. And they were trying, again, to develop that personality and physical profile of who they're, who they're searching for, Chet. You know, was he the kind of guy that got tired quickly? Did he have stamina? Did he play any sports? What was his outlook on life? All these things you bring in. And then they want to know how much food he had, how much water he had, those type of things. There's a good chance mom and dad didn't know that, but they ask. November 15th, bigger turnout than the day before. 
they divided the search groups into groups, into grids, and they had them search different areas off that trailhead. Now, I can tell you, searching through the woods of Mount Rainier would be very tiring because some of those woods are very thick with a lot of downfall and it makes very slow going. Now, photographers such as Chet like to take pictures of landscape. And how do you get pictures of landscape? Well, you get those from being up high with a clear area in front of you to get a good view. So maybe he would be looking for an area to go up higher on the side of a cliff or something to look. I don't know. you got to think outside the box. November 16th, 100 ground pounders, three dog teams, and late that afternoon it started to snow. And this is one of the most interesting parts of this story. It shows you how thorough the search was. Searchers are moving along. In midday, they find a dog walking through the woods. And the dog is injured. Didn't say the type of dog. Said it had a collar with a name. Had some cuts on it. Didn't look like predation cuts, but cuts. So the searchers take the dog in and National Park Service calls the phone number and they have a policeman go out and do a welfare check because they couldn't find an answer. Turns out the neighbors were in the process of reporting that person missing and his car. Police arrive. So the owner of the dog is missing, but nobody had reported him missing. So the police get to the house because NPS had found the dog and they start searching and right away they find the owner's car ran off the side of the road with the guy in the car, still alive, but trapped. Unbelievable set of circumstances. Unbelievable. How long would the guy have been in the car if the searchers hadn't found his dog? And his dog was okay. And so was the guy, but they had to extricate him and he lived. How's that for a story? Couldn't believe it. So on November 16th, they, they decide that they're going to terminate the search. Now, in my humble opinion, humble opinion, they didn't start the search until November 13th. And they terminated on November 16th. Friends, that's only three days. That's not, that's not half this. That's not half of what you give a normal search almost seven days and what bothers me about this is they had a good target they knew for sure Chet was there okay they found his car they had a scent hit and now they give up <laughs> what is this I don't get it so on November 17th Rick Hansen, the dad, meets with NPS. This is what they said in their reports. Rick said that he was going to continue to go out looking for his son, put on snowshoes and go off trail and look. He's got to find him. It's just in his soul. I hear you, Huck. But he said that he was happy with the effort the National Park Service gave. He also said that as a gift to the National Park Service, he was gonna go home and he was gonna look at one of the, for one of the large formatted photos that his son had taken of the park, in the park, and give it to NPS as a gift. Wow, wow. Now, I've told you guys this before, but I'm going to go over it again. Search and Rescue is not going to like what I'm going to tell you, but I don't care. You're my friends, they. Search and Rescue organizations aren't always going to tell you the absolute truth. It's tiring to search. 
It's an effort by everyone to be there out in the cold at a location. But the only group of people who are, are just itching to find the person who's missing is the family. And the family never knows what the proper protocol is to search for somebody. That's right, they don't know. They have to do it. Everything is in the hands of that search and rescue coordinator. And if they say, ah, you know, three days, that's, I don't know where else we could search. Well, let's talk to Mr. Politis. Where would you search, Mr. Politis? Well, in my history, you could sometimes search an area three, four, five times before you finally find that person that's there. So just because you searched it once doesn't mean that's an adequate search. And can I ask you about the canine that tracked for several miles? Do you think that that was a good hit on that scent? Well, you said it was. Well, how about sending three or four dogs back into that area and spending three or four days following up on that? Because we know he was there, right? Hmm. But you see, if you don't have the wherewithal to stand up to him and say it, they're just going to push you into a corner until you say, yeah, I don't know where else you could search. That, that makes sense to me. Okay. Thanks for trying. And I'm not picking on National Park Service. This is the way it is many times. And the vast majority of time, the search and rescue coordinator, they've never done that before. I, and I know you're going to think, oh, come on. No, that's the truth. Big cases like Chet's, where you have hundreds of people involved, happen very rarely. It's hard to get experience at this kind of work. So, they call off the search. Now, fast forward to May 4th, 1998. National Park Service gets a call from a witness who saw a poster of Chet and said, hey, I saw that guy. The witness said that on the day that Chet vanished, the witness and his girlfriend had hiked to Shriners Peak Lookout. And they were enjoying the views. Now Shriners Peak, right next to the highway. It's a pretty good hike, but it's not far from the parking lot. You got a hucket and bucket to get up there. It's on the top of a mountain. It's got an outstanding views. It's a place that Chet would go to take photos. So the witness says that he's up there with his girlfriend. They're enjoying the views. And up the trail comes Chet. And they said that the, he had a bottle of water in one hand and a shoulder pack, not a full backpack, just like a shoulder pack that he was carrying. Now that resonated with me right away because I've carried a big formatted 35 millimeter camera and a shoulder pack just like that. So he said that he, he was, wasn't overly communicative, smiled, said hi, and walked around the fire lookout with a light meter appearing to be looking at the view, checking the light meter, determining if he was going to take a shot or not. Walked around a couple times, checked the light meter, didn't see anything he liked apparently, and he departed back down the trail that he walked up on. Now this was May of 1998. He disappeared in November of 97. So that was about six months later. Pretty good hit. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty good one right there. And then the witness said that they went back down that same trail to their car, didn't see anything. Okay, so that to me says that somewhere between that lookout and hopefully the parking lot, Chet went off trail somewhere. To me, I'd be looking for high ground somewhere around there where he took off. And as I've told, it's okay. And as I've told you before, you go, you go off trail in a location like that, you go off trail in a location like that, you break your leg, good chance you're dead. There's a good chance you're not going to be found. 
why you carry a personal locator beacon. And I'm sure that Chet invested thousands of dollars in his photo equipment. $300 he should have invested in a personal locator beacon. Just saying. I'm not trying to make a fool out of him. I'm just saying. Well, subsequent to that, the National Park Service put up a, a series of cadaver dogs. Never got a hit. Which means they never hit on a body. And bodies can... Your dog can smell one of those bodies miles away. Now, February 8th, 1999, there was a public service announcement in several of the newspapers around Mount Rainier about the showing of Chet's photos at the Jackson Visitor Center at Mount Rainier in Paradise. Wow. Wow. If I would have been the parents, it would have made me cry to be there. Now the area of the disappearance. There are four people missing in that area just immediately east of where Chet disappeared. Yeah. And there's 15 people missing in the park west of where Chet disappeared. Yeah. I don't know what happened to Chet, but it's not normal, it's very concerning, and because he was a photographer, it really, really bothers me. Now, if the search and rescue people out there are listening are offended because of what I said, I'm sorry, it's not, not the intention. The intention is to give victims, families, a proper shot at finding their loved ones. And sometimes there needs to be a victim advocate, somebody who knows the inner workings of a search and rescue to advocate for the victim's family. And there's the vast, vast majority of search and rescue people are great. Small percentage that maybe aren't thinking of the best interests of the family or the victim, but their best interests. And at those times, you need somebody to step in and be your advocate. Please share this video all around, please. And understand, there's going to be many more disappearances this summer. And if people just went out and bought a personal locator beacon, it could save their life. By the way, this is the kindness revolution. It doesn't hurt, and it doesn't cost anything to be kind to people. So the next time you're out in public, you see somebody in distress, stop and help them. Politis out.